let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this glorious opportunity that you've given us to assemble at thy feet and hear you speak to us the word of exhortation that we need for today. I bless you because forever your word is settled in heaven. And Jesus did say that heaven and earth may pass away, but not one jot or tittle will ever fail to be fulfilled in your word. Dear Lord, as we listen to your word today, I ask, dear Lord, by, that by the Holy Spirit, you will quicken our understanding, quicken our hearts, quicken our minds, cause, to, cause us to understand, to receive, and to obey your word. And as we obey, I pray that the fruit of that word will be manifested in our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. Speak to us by yourself and glorify your name in our lives. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. You are welcome to the Bible study for tonight. And we are continuing from the series of studies we've been having in Acts of the Apostles. Tonight, we are looking at Acts chapter 13, from verse 13 to 42. It seems like a long passage, but there are important things that God wants to show us from that scripture. And I believe that today, if you stay alert and listen attentively, God will open your understanding and will help you to catch something. It may just be one word or one phrase, or one sentence that will change your life and circumstances for the better in Jesus' name. In Acts chapter 13, we've had a few studies there and seen the work the Apostle Paul and others have been doing. The chapter started with the, with the leaders, five of them mentioned by name, who were in the church at Antioch praying, ministering unto God in prayer with fasting, how that the Holy Spirit spake, and says, separate me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work I have called them. And how the, uh, um, the two of them were sent on missionary journey, and they took John Mark among, along with them. They got to various places. How God broke the power of darkness that was holding a particular territory and gave them breakthrough. And how they carried on in that uh, missionary Journey. So in verse, uh, from verse 13 that we are going to read today, we are told of what happened in a particular synagogue in that missionary journey. I'll read the text and maybe I will explain along as I go. And at the end of it, I will also summarize some of the things that God is speaking to you and to me about. I've titled the message today, Exhortation. You can call it in full, Exhortation for the People. Or you can put it another way, calling it Divine Exhortation for you and me. That is, God has exhortation for you today. He has exhortation for me today. And that is why the book of Revelation mentioned a number of times. He says, see that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit is, is saying to the churches. And that didn't stop at the book of Revelation because the Holy Spirit is still ministering today. He's still saying things to the church. And it is the word of exhortation that God wants you and I to know and to live by. And so uh, as we go through this study, I want you to keep your ears open. Don't just see it as exhortation that Paul gave to a particular church uh, somewhere else. No, I want you to be asking God, what exhortation do you have for me today in my current situation, in my current circumstance, in the current uh, uh, place where I find myself? What are you saying to me? What are you telling me to do? What step do I need to take to make things different for me? Now, I read from verse 13. He says, now when Paul and his company lose from Paphos, 
they came to Peca in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Peca, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. See, they came to a synagogue here, and they were sent by the Holy Spirit on missionary journey. But this was not their local church, and they respected the protocol in that synagogue. So when they got there, they sat down. I think it was just this week, sometime this week, we studied uh, um, an exhortation that was given, I believe, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, that when you go into the house of God, uh, don't be in a haste to say something or do something, but just sit down and listen because uh, God does not value or is not pleased with the labor of fools. So here they came to this uh, local church called Synagogue and they sat down. They didn't go to the people and say, we are missionaries. We were sent forth by the Holy Spirit. We want to take over the worship and tell you what you need to do. No, they sat down waiting for a golden opportunity that will be open for them uh, by God and the Holy Spirit who sent them. Now, the Holy Spirit sent them to this place. And the Holy Spirit knows how to bring them to the pulpit and how to open the doors for them. Let's not force open the doors that God has not opened. But let's be sensitive to recognize doors that God has opened and walk in straight away so that we can accomplish the thing that God has for you, for you and me. In verse 15, we are told, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So the, the normal pro, uh, procedures or routines uh, of the worship continued in the synagogue. They read the laws, they uh, heard the reading of the apostles, and after that, we are told the, uh, the rulers sent for Paul and, si and Silas. Did they know Paul and Silas before? I don't know. Maybe they've known them before. Perhaps they knew, knew that they were apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ that have come to their local church and that that may be opportunity for them to also hear what they will have to say to them. So they said, if we have word of exhortation for the people, that is why I said this topic can be titled exhortation. That is where I took the title from, exhortation. I also said it could be exhortation for the people, but because that is part of the phrase. It says, if you have any word of exhortation for the people. So here, um, they, they, uh, uh, they were given the opportunity. The Holy Spirit opened the door for them. He brought them into the position that they would be able to share the word of God with these people. And when they were given that opportunity, they did not shy back. They did not say, oh, we've not prepared a sermon. Um, we just came to visit and to worship with you. Uh, so maybe next time, let's go and prepare a three-part series or ten-part series and come back and share with you. They had to depend on the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit sends you, the Holy Spirit will speak what he wants to speak through you at the time. That is why the apostles were admonished uh, by Jesus Christ that if uh, they bring you before court, magistrate, don't even bother, don't think, don't worry about what you are going to say because when you stand on the dock, the Holy Spirit will put words in your mouth and you will begin to say even the things you did not plan. And I found that happening in my life so many times that when I just come to share the gospel, the Holy Spirit take over. In fact, in some of the messages I preached that uh, were uh, viewed by many people, many comments sent and so on, some of them were messages that I felt I have lost it, that I didn't have what to say. And I just prayed before the start of the, uh, uh, the ministration, Holy Spirit is not me. I want you to take over and administer to your people. And the Holy Spirit took over 
and began to minister, began to share, and began to uh, lead, lead people to understand what God had in mind for them. So, when you get to where God wants you to minister, just open your mouth, start from anywhere. The Holy Spirit will take over and share with you. In fact, even though I'm reading from the outline that I sent out, I prepared and sent out to you, there are already some things I have said here that are not in the outline that I didn't plan to say. But as I'm speaking, the Lord is bringing things to my mind and I'm speaking them. I know those are the words of exhortation that God has for you and for me even today. In verse 16, we are told, Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his son said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, keep audience. So that immediately tells us what the composition of this uh, synagogue was. They were people of Israel, people that fear God. And so you would have noticed from them that these were people that already knew God. They were children of Israel. They feared God. And yet God had a word of exhortation for them. You know that there are times people feel, oh, the Bible tells me, you will be taught of the Holy Spirit. You don't need any man to teach you. And some people may think, well, I've been a Christian for 10 years, 20 years, 5 years. I don't need anybody to teach me anything. I know everything all by myself. But the Holy Spirit still had word. For these people that were described as men of Israel today, you will say Christians. And people that fear God. And Paul told them, give audience. In other words, listen attentively. Even if you've been a man or woman of God for many years, you still need to listen attentively to the word of God that is coming to you tonight. Because tonight, God will tell you something that he has in mind for you. Something you may not have thought about. Something maybe you may have known about, but it didn't register in your heart. And today, it can become registered in Jesus' name. Verse 17, it, he narrated the story. It says, the God of these people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he the manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterwards, they decided a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Seas, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, it is God that appoints, it is God that removed. And when he has removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my ways. I wish that can be said of me, that I'm a man of God, a man after God's heart that will fulfill all the will of God. I wish that could be said of every one of us in this Bible study and those that will hear this message later on, that we are men and women of God that will fulfill all the will of God. Not some, not many, but all the will of God. Do you notice what is happening here? That when these brethren, Paul and Silas, were given opportunity to share the gospel, they started from the known facts. From what these people would have known, the history of the children of Israel, to get them connected. But they didn't stop at the history of the children of Israel. They wanted to use that to show the connection between that and all that has been happening to the Lord Jesus Christ, so as to show the full connection and to link them and point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 23, it says, Of this man's seed, see the, the link, he talked about Abraham, talked about the children of Israel in Egypt, Egypt talked about David, talked about uh, uh, and Sam, uh, um, Samuel uh, 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 and others. And then he now talked about Jesse and, and David. He says, uh, uh, verse 23, Of this man's seed, that is David's seed, had God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel 
a savior, Jesus. He places a link between David and Jesus Christ. When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his cause, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to lose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is this word of salvation sent. You see, these people were asking them, if you have word of exhortation, say on, speak to us. And now he's linking all that he has said to this. He's telling them, this is that word of exhortation that you are looking for. It is the word of salvation that God has sent to you. That is not just this ritual, religious worship uh, uh, that uh, is of interest to God. God wants you to be saved, to be born again. Verse 27, for they that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Do you notice the danger of just following religion, but not being connected to God? He told these people that these people that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, they did not know him. And yet look at what he says there in verse 27. They knew him not, nor, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath. They, in other words, the, pro, the voices of the prophets are read. They keep hearing the word of God, just like I'm reading now. The people keep hearing, keep hearing this and that, but you don't find them doing it. They don't understand. Their eyes have not opened. No wonder Paul prayed for the Ephesian believers that uh, the eyes of their understanding be opened, that they will have revelation uh, knowledge of God, revelation in the knowledge of God. We need that revelation. We need that impartation. We need that power of God to touch us, to open our eyes, to cause us to see and to understand and to have that personal encounter with God that will remove all the blindness, all the blockages, and bring us into good and perfect understanding of uh, the truth. And it tells us here that when we keep on reading and don't know, the negative prophecies that are made in the Bible can even be fulfilled through us. The Bible talked about the Jews killing and destroying Jesus Christ, and that became fulfilled among the same people that have been reading the word of God and have been expecting the Messiah because their understanding were not open. This is why we need our spiritual understanding to be open so that we will only be fulfilling the positive and good prophecies that God has for us. Verse 23, sorry, 28. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet decided their pilot that he should be, be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. He did not want the story to end in defeat. And therefore, he immediately linked it to the resurrection. Yes, you kill him, but God raised him up. The power of God is greater than what your power in killing him. Verse 31, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. Verse 32, and we declare unto you glad tidings. This is the word of exhortation he's bringing to them now. This is what we are coming to tell you. Not just the old rituals and routine of worshiping and reading the prophets without understanding, but we are bringing to you glad tidings. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God had fulfilled the same unto us, their children in that he had raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Verse 34, And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. Jesus' resurrection is completely different 
from all the other people that were raised to that dead, sorry, raised to life after they died, because all of them died again. But Jesus Christ, when he resurrected, he has never died and will never die again. He has been translated into heaven to be with God. Verse 34. And at considering that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had saved his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was led to unto his fathers and saw corruption. Before I continue, let me just comment on something that just picked my attention right then. So he's talking to these people about Jesus Christ being risen from the dead, his body not seeing corruption, and he's telling them very clearly that this prophecy was not referring to David because David died and saw corruption, but God was speaking this to about Jesus Christ. But the phrase that speak to me, uh, that I want to comment on is in verse 36. He says, for David, after he has saved his own generation by the will of God, fell on a slave. Everybody has their generation to serve. And that is why I commented at first that as you look at this story, don't just think of it as the exhortation that Paul gave to this synagogue when which he visited. See, think about it as the what is the message that God has for me today? What is the divine exhortation for my life today? Because Paul, Silas, they served their generation. They did their missionary work. They've completed what God wanted them to do. They have died and gone to glory. But you and I are living. This is our generation. And there is a word that God has for me in this generation. There is a word that God has for you. God wants to speak to you, wants to speak to me, <clears throat> but I need to be ready to listen <clears throat> to what he wants to say. And he continued in verse 37. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of exhortation they had for these people. They identified what these people needed most at that time. That is not just the liturgical rituals of coming, reading the Bible, singing songs, and going home. But what they needed here was salvation, was forgiveness of sin. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. That all that the law of Moses did, all those animal sacrifices couldn't justify you couldn't completely set you free forever. But God has provided a sacrifice through Jesus Christ and that sacrifice has set you free, has delivered you and uh, it, it, it is for you. So he spoke to them very clearly. This is the word of exhortation. This is what you need. This is what you need to do. And I expect a, a response, a reaction uh, from you. Uh, after you have heard this word, the same thing too. God expects a reaction from you, a response, positive response to his word when the word comes to you. And it goes on in verse 40 to acknowledge, to, uh, to admonish them. He says, beware therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despise us and wonder and perish. For I walk a walk in your days, a walk which ye shall in no wise believe though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. So you can see in brief summary here that Paul and Silas went to this synagogue as part of their missionary journey. When they got there, they joined the service, they sat down, and uh, they worship with them. And a time came that they were given opportunity to speak. Was it just an accident or a coincidence? No. Everything was orchestrated by God. And 
as they were given the opportunity to speak, you've seen how eloquently, how uh, uh, thoroughly Paul narrated the history of the Jewish people and linked it to the salvation message. And towards the end of that narration, he warned them of the danger of despising the gospel. Today, the same danger still applies. If we hear all this word and we despise it, well, uh, there could be terrible things that may be associated with it. Now, we are told at the end of the service, the Jews departed. But the Gentiles came back and said, please, what you spoke to us was wonderful. We want to hear it again. Can you come back next Sunday and preach to us these words again? That ought to be our attitude that when we hear the word of God, we don't just say thank you, bye-bye, and, uh, and that's the end of it. There should be continuity. There should be further expectation. There should be more connection, wanting to know more, wanting to draw nearer to God and to have more opportunity of hearing the word of God. That means that the word of God you heard last Sunday is not enough to take you all through till the eternity come. The word of God you heard last month, last year, is not enough to take you till eternity. You need to hear it again, over and over again. I mean, the food you ate yesterday wasn't sufficient to carry you through uh, uh, today. That is why you would have eaten again today. The food you ate last year have been have, have, have saved its purpose. You need new food this year to be able to carry on fulfilling the purpose that God has for you today. And especially in the type of world we are living now, where we see a lot of misinformation, misrepresent, misrepresentation, and people wanting to change the laws, change regulations, change everything. We want, uh, you, you need to know that in times like this, you just need to know God and love God and draw nearer and closer to God and be a vessel of honor in God's hand. You need to hear the word of God freshly every day, every moment. Soak yourself with the word of God. Let it be something that fills you, fill your heart, fill your mind uh, continuously in Jesus' name. And before I round up this story, remember what I said, that Paul and Silas have saved his generation. They gave the word of exhortation that was needed by that congregation. And that may even be the word of exhortation that you need today. It may be the word of exhortation that I need today. I am not discrediting what Paul did. But I want you to remember what Jesus Christ said in Revelation when he sent the letter to the seven uh, churches through the hand of Paul. He told them, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To every one of those churches, he made the same comment. So that phrase, that statement was repeated over and over again. And guess what? We are living in the age of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has not stopped speaking. He is still speaking today. He is sending out words of exhortation so that people will know, will be able to understand what God wants them to do. What is a, 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 a exhortation? Exhortation is, the, uh, is uh, defined as an address or communication to somebody to do something. Uh, uh, urging somebody to do something or to respond in a particular way. That is what exhortation is. And the word of God is full of exhortation. Exhortation to you and me, to every one of us, on what I ought to do, what you ought to do. The exhortation you needed yesterday may be completely different from the one you need today. The exhortation you needed last week may be completely different from the one you need this week. That is why we've got to be sensitive and open to God and say, God, today, what word of exhortation do you have for me? The word of exhortation you need when you are successful and happy and everything is going on very well is different from the word of exhortation you need when maybe things are not going well or you are facing some anxious thoughts or sickness or problem in one area or the other it may be completely different. And so you need to call upon the Lord and say, God, I want to be sensitive to you. I want to remain with you. I want to know what the word of exhortation is 
that you have for me today. And so as I run up this story, I want to uh, 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 just ask you this question. And I will also uh, uh, try to offer some answers uh, in terms of some of the scriptures. If Paul and Silas were sent to this church today, if we were the one that asked him, uh, uh, if men and brethren, if you have word of exhortation, say on, what will Paul say to me today? What will Silas say to me today? Well, we know Paul and Silas have died. They've gone to heaven. They are with God. But the work of God has not stopped because the Holy Spirit has taken over. And it's the Holy Spirit that is still speaking. And so today, I want to open up and say, Oh, Holy Spirit, what is the word of exhortation that you have for me today? What is the word of exhortation that you have for us? And I believe that if we open up to God, there are many words of exhortation that God may speak to us today. I'm just showing you some of the examples in the scriptures, what those words of exhortation may, uh, could, could be. And it could even be one of these that I read that may be the exact word that you need for your situation today. In, or it may be something else that the Holy Spirit will drop in your heart and speak to you about. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, we find Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy was his protege, the son in the Lord. And he says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hand. So what was the word of exhortation from Paul to Timothy in this place? He was, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Don't just act as if nothing has happened. I laid hands on you. You may not feel a different. You may not feel stronger, bolder, but the power of God is in you. Stay up that gift of God. Make use of it wherever you are. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, we find, or 1 to 2, we find a similar thing repeated. Peter told, uh, 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 wrote to this church, he says, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, which I stay up your pure mind. Stay up. See, when we have all these thoughts, depression settling upon us, worry, anxiety, it can make us go down. And it is in such a time like that, you need to stay up yourself. Wake up, shake all those things off and tell yourself, I'm a child of God. The promises of God are yet an amen in my life. I cannot allow myself to be depressed, to be put down by all these things that is happening. I must rise up. I must get up. I must walk. I must do what God wants me to do. Verse 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be mindful. Always remember. That is the thing you need to bear in mind. The word of God that has been spoken. Not all the visions, interpretations, all the things that are going on, signs and wonders, all signs and wonders are part of the scriptures, but not all signs of wonders come from God. And God is telling us we need to take heed, be mindful of the word, be mindful of the door, says the Lord. What the Bible actually says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we see another thing that the Holy Spirit may be telling you and me. It says, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So God is telling you, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Don't allow participating in church services, going to church to become burdensome to you, to become a normal routine that you become bored and you say, well, maybe today I want to do something different, something more exciting. I will not go to church today. Or don't allow maybe the busyness of life Yes, we go to work. I go to work as well. And sometimes I come back and so tired. Don't allow the tiredness from work to say, okay, maybe today no family devotion, no time for prayer. I'm too tired. Let me just lie down and sleep. God understand. No, the Bible says not forsaking. Don't forsake. We live in dangerous times. It is at times like this we need to assemble together the more. We need to pray the more. Whether it is in homes, small families, uh, the members get together and pray, or in church, or with a prayer partner, or let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That is what 
the Spirit is saying to us. In Mark chapter 13, verse 37, the Lord Jesus Christ says, And what shall I and what I say unto you, I say unto all, wash. This is the time to wash. The devil is going around like a roaring lion looking for whom to, uh, uh, to, uh, to kill. Uh, a serpent crawl around, lying in wait, looking for somebody to attack. I was listening to a, a man of God preaching last week. This man of God used to love. He, he, he has done so many different activities, playing golf, swimming in, in waters, uh, riding horses, uh, oh, so many different kinds of exercises. But he said he was watching a documentary one day and he saw how they caught a big snake. I mean, these people that study the lifestyle of animals, they caught the snake and somehow managed to put a camera on the head of the snake and then let the snake to go its own way. And they were monitoring. So anywhere the snake goes, the camera will show them where the snake is, what the snake is seeing, and how the snake is reacting and responding to those things that is happening. And so he was watching this documentary and so eventually the snake went through this land, this grass, this area, a climb up trees, came down, and so on. And after a while, the snake went into a water. And then he went into the part of the water that is uh, uh, not uh, like, that is like stagnant. You know, in a river, you may have the main side, the water is flowing, but maybe at the corner in one side of the bank, the water may not be flowing as in other side. And then the snake stayed there inside that pool of water. He stayed there for weeks. He was just watching and monitoring. And he says, uh, when people come to fish water, the snake will just come near and be looking at those people. And how do they know? Because from the camera, they can see that these are people fetching water at the point that the snake is. And then when animals come to drink water, the snake will just come up and look. He's more or less sizing those uh, 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 animals to see, can I attack this one? Is this the type I can capture? And so on. And so the, way, uh, the snake was doing that. For weeks, he stayed in just that one spot, patiently waiting. And one day, he saw an animal come to the same spot, wanting to drink water. And the snake uh, 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 looked at the animal and felt, this is my opportunity. I can get this one. The snake just swooped out of the water, caught this animal, and strangled that animal. And so this man of God says, the moment he saw that, he became afraid of swimming anymore because he was wondering, this water I'm going to enter into, do I know what is in it? Do I know where the snake is hiding? And so he became afraid of uh, 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 of uh, uh, going for a swim. What is that telling you? Like Jesus was telling these people, what I say unto you, I say unto everybody, what? Don't just live this life as if it is only uh, all that happened is all that we can see. There is more to it. There is a spiritual element. There is a spiritual battle. There are enemies, uh, enemies going around looking for who to destroy. That is why you need to watch. Watch your action. Watch your behavior. Watch your attitude. Watch your movement. Watch your thoughts. Because even when you don't know there is danger, there may be serious danger there. Watch your steps. And watch the things that you do. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. The Bible says fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That ye may be tried and ye shall uh, uh, suffer and uh, have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. What is the spirit telling you? What is the word of exhortation for you today? He's telling you, be faithful unto death. Be faithful in remaining with God, remaining with the word of God, and God will reward you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the Bible says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What is he telling you? Look diligently. Be careful, be thorough, meticulous.
don't leave any stone unturned. Look diligently, lest you fall. That means anybody can fall. If it was not possible for anybody to fall from the grace of God, God will not tell us to wash. And he says, wash, don't allow root of bitterness. Where does root of bitterness take hold? It is in the heart, in the mind, through the thoughts, through the stories that you hear, through the things that make you angry. You heard this of that, heard this of the other person, and it made you to be angry. It made you to, uh, to be furious. God is saying, look diligently, lest those things take place in your life. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Behold, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What is God telling you in these days of error, in these days of false prophecy, of false teaching, false teachers, false religious Christians, uh, de 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 deception of demons? God is telling you here that you need to earnestly contend for the faith which was delivered unto you, unto the saints. That is what you need to contend for the word, not the vision, not the revelation, not the various manifestations that are taking place here and there, but the word of God. Uh, I was just listening to Benny Hinn preaching recently, and he emphasized on a particular point. He says uh, the apostle uh, uh, talked uh, uh, about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, the things they saw, the things that they heard, and so on. And immediately after that, they said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, Benihim explained that what they were saying is that the word of prophecy is greater than all this uh, transfiguration. The miracles they saw, all the things that they saw, that the word of prophecy is of greater importance than any one of those things. And that is the way I should take things myself. I shouldn't allow myself to just follow all the things that I see, the signs and wonders. Many of them may be of God, but not every one of them. I shouldn't be led astray by any of them, but I should hold on to the word of God. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, the Bible says, Wash ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. This is the time to be strong. The Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. He is wanting you to stand firm in the faith because troubles will come, trials, sickness, situations will come that will want to dampen your, your faith. That is the time to say, no, I will not be dampened. I will not be discouraged. I will not faint. I will stand strong in the faith. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32, the Bible says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, this was Peter, uh, sorry, Jesus speaking to Peter. He says, behold, Satan has decided to have you, that he may save you as wheat. But I pray for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What is God's word of exhortation to you? That at the time you are feeling you are very strong, you are very powerful, that you, are, you can swallow a lion, you can fight anything, you can move any mountain. God is telling you, behold, Satan has decided to have you, that he may save you like wheat. You see, when you think you are wise, you are strong, you know everything, you can challenge anything. That may be the point where danger is lurking around. And God is telling you like he told, like Jesus told Peter, he says, Satan has desired to have you. If Satan desired to have Peter, who are we to think that Satan will not desire to have us, to sift us, to destroy us like we? This is when we need to draw close to God and stay close to God, stay close in prayer, don't allow weakness to make you cut corners and uh, hinder you from the things you ought to do. Uh, from prayer, from reading the word of God, from seeking the face of God. When Satan wants to attack people, sometimes he can bring weakness or sickness to reduce their uh, uh, maybe time of uh, prayer, maybe praying with other people, family, devotion, attending church, or maybe even quiet personal quiet time or personal prayers, he weakened people first of all before he, he attacked. He removed the source of their strength. And the source of the strength is in all this fellowship and the word of God and prayer. And when the person becomes weakened, then Satan says, yes, he's so weak now, I can get him if I get there. Never allow that to happen in your life. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, 
Jesus Christ says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that past which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. There is a crown for the overcomers. I want to get my crown. You want to get your own crown. And God is saying, hold fast what you've got. Hold fast what you know. Hold fast to the word of God. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 10 to 12, this was Jesus Christ speaking to the people. And he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. In other words, don't keep quiet about it. Don't put it on the shelf. Read it, practice it, share it with other people, preach it. In verse 11, he says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Have you heard the exhortation that God has for you? Maybe there is something else the Holy Spirit is whispering to you that I have not said. They are equally important as the one I have said. Understand them, hold on to them, apply them to your life, and whatever you do, wherever you go, remember there is a word of exhortation for today. And you need to understand it. You need to apply it for your, to your life. It is by knowing, applying it, that your life will become victorious, different, and will bring glory to God in Jesus' name. We are going to talk to God right now in prayer. I want you to call upon God and to tell God, Lord, I have heard your word. Paul has done his work, missionary work, and has come to be with the Lord. Paul gave his word of exhortation to the people he met. There are people I'm still meeting every day. Lord, what is the word of exhortation you want me to give to them? Help me to be faithful in doing so. And also for yourself, what is the word of exhortation God is having for you? Ask God to open your heart, open your eyes, open your understanding, give you revelation knowledge in the truth so that you will understand and apply that word of exhortation to your life. Just talk to God right now. Call upon God this moment and tell God, Lord, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. And let me keep your word. Keep the word of exhortation. Obey that word of exhortation. Live by that word of exhortation. Follow the word of exhortation. Also, I will give out the word of exhortation to people that are around me. Call upon God right now. Look up to him. Ask him to help you. Ask him to minister to you. Ask him to see you through. Ask him to perfect that which concerns you. The word of exhortation. Word of exhortation to you, to be to all of us. Just call upon the Lord right now. Look up to him this moment. Surrender all to him. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you, wants to speak to me. He has a word of exhortation for my situation right now. And the only thing that will make a difference is me hearing that word of exhortation and apply it to my life. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. A blessed and everlasting Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word of exhortation that you've shared with us today. I ask, dear Lord, that you will help us to understand, to apply them to our lives, and to live by them all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. I ask, Father, that as we apply this word to our lives, a change will take place. And you will bless us and you will see us through 
and make us vessels of honor in your hand. Dear Father, Paul and Silas have completed their work in their generation. They've come to be with you, but we are now serving our own generation. I pray, God, you will show us what we need to do for our generation. You'll give us the word of exhortation for our generation, and we will not shy back from telling them, from declaring that word, and Lord, as they hear and apply them, you will walk a walk in their lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen.